Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Gilbert. I'm Associate Director in the VRAC and part of the ACI program. And I'm eager to uh, welcome you to this talk. It's the third talk in our Women in HCI series. Uh, today we have Allison Druin, who is Director of the Human Computer Interaction Lab at University of Maryland. If some of you may remember Ben Schneiderman, who was here a couple years ago, um, Allison is uh, his successor in that lab in terms of directing it. She has done a lot with digital libraries and participatory design with children. And her educational path includes the Rhode Island School of Design, the MIT Media Lab, the University of New Mexico. Uh, and so she's done an interesting path that she'll tell you about. Her most recent book is The Mobile Technology for Children, edited by Allison Druin with over how many? 43. Authors? 43 authors. Mm -hmm. Wow. So uh, please welcome this Allison to this talk funded by the uh, graduate, uh, graduate College and the STEM Speaker Series. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, this is a really wonderful series um, because I've, uh, this is the first time I've ever spoken in an HCI and women's series. So what does that say about our HCI area that we're not having that, huh? <laughs> OK. So anyway, this is great. Um, and uh, this morning was amazing just seeing what a lot of you are all doing. It's just very exciting. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you uh, specifically about the mobile technologies kinds of um, uh, things we've been doing and, and what other people are thinking about. But I don't know how many of you have noticed. This is a test. Um, yeah, I changed the title of the talk from the advertisement. It's uh, Mobile Technologies for the World's Children. Okay, why did I change it? Well, it actually has to do with what I found out about mobile technologies. Um, mobile technologies, uh, when we were first thinking about creating an NSF workshop, that's all we were going to do, an NSF-sponsored workshop a few years ago, um, and no one had actually thought about it for children. Well, we got 40 people in a room together, um, it turned out, from nine countries, and they talked about, oh, a lot of different kinds of technologies. But what they also talked about, which I couldn't, which I didn't expect, was that they talked about mobile technologies in the context of the world. This is possibly one of the first global technology trends that we are seeing. And so the book that ultimately came out of this NSF workshop, um, is in fact the these same nine countries are represented and these authors are amazing I have nothing to do with how good they are but what I want to do is I want to start out with a few people's words from the book because they um, they describe some of the the challenges actually in some interesting ways this first person is actually a professor here in Iowa I know the wrong college, but anyway, <laughs> the wrong university, he's at the other one. Um, anyway, uh, Juan Pablo Arcad um, is actually uh, um, here talking about the one laptop per child um, laptops in Uruguay. All right, and he, um, he explains that, um, that in, this small, in this small rural area uh, with dairy farms, um, that in spite of the proximity to the capital city, the local culture has a rural flavor and, uh, with many inhabitants. For example, having a distinct, distinctive rural accent and so on. Now, um, he goes on to explain that the local elementary school has 150 students um, and that in May 2007, every child received an EXO laptop um, from the OLPC Foundation. Um, and there was a lot of attention given to what they were going to do with this and how it was going to change their educational system and, and so on. Um, this, for those of you that um, were possibly living, you know, in um, outer Mongolia that don't know about um, the OLPC, uh, the One Laptop Per Child um, initiative, this was the originally called the $100 laptops. You've heard about that and then suddenly it wasn't a hundred dollars and now they're all netbooks and everyone's competing against everybody. But anyway, so um, back a few years ago, this, this was the only game in town um, and Uruguay decided they were gonna do this experiment. Well, what they found, guess what? 
what, they, what did they do with the, these technologies? The children enjoyed taking pictures and recording video of themselves. Um, and they also made um, uh, uses of the technology um, by, uh, let's see, recording video of their favorite television programs and, and of rural life. For example, they uploaded many videos depicting life on dairy farms for the school's blog. Okay, so this, yes, this fancy laptop that can do all these interactive things, they used it to, to take pictures. And this is in Uruguay, and they're still using it to take pictures. Um, all right, another author from our book um, in the UK, uh, he um, actually, uh, Matt, um, okay, wait, I'm losing the name here, Matt Jones. Um, from uh, Swansea in the UK, he talks about Ben, a seven-year-old, is practicing to be a marine biologist. Um, he's got a notebook and a net in hand, and he carefully scribbles data about the sea um, uh, and uh, about the anatomy uh, and something like that, and the seaweed. Every few minutes, he asks me to hand him my iPhone to take a picture. Uh, nervously, I watch as he tries to operate the fiddly interface to capture some murky looking sea life. The gadget held perilously close to the water. After each shot, he shows it to me and his brother and his sister, but never wants to see the shots again or print them out. He understands something about the technology that some grown up mobile designers still fail to recognize. Mobile phone cameras are often there just to capture and share the moment. Um, in that very moment, share the moment in that very moment, a sort of hyper Kodak culture. All right, so what these people are talking about is how do people naturally, not when you're told by, for a school assignment, what do they naturally do with these devices? Okay, um, now at the back of the book, um, Janet Reed from the UK and I actually talked about um, where the future may be. And um, we actually describe uh, a future scenario for mobile technology that, uh, that Julie and Megan are heading for the school dance where they meet uh, Palexa and Joe. Getting ready, the two girls decide which clothes to wear. Shorts, leggings, will it be the pink top, the purple one? Then, of course, there is the discussion about the mobile technology. What shall we wear from our mobile kit? Uh, Julie asks Megan. I don't think I'll need the mouthpiece or the screen, but I thought I'd take the camera. How about you wear the camera and I'll wear a screen? Just, just in case you want to check our photos when we get, get there. And the girls go out wearing their mobile devices and hail the first taxi uh, they see. Um, so, you know, that, all, that, that whole thing has to do with imaging. But it also has to do with, um, it also has to do with that mobile technologies are very much in the moment and very much in the fabric of our physical beings and what's happening. So what I want you to do is, is to understand that today, when I talk about children and technologies, I'm talking about the eye child and the eye technology, okay? So what do I, how do I define the eye child? All right, the eye child is international. This is not, we, you no longer can be designing for somebody here in Iowa without imagining that somebody in Uruguay may use it, okay? Unless it's a cave, they may not get to that for a while. Um, also, these children are very independent. They're very independent in terms of their technology use. They, um, they expect to be able to go and create things, to go and um, initiate things. They are also very interactive. They expect that, that, that there's not just going to be a push of information, that they are going to be able, um, uh, what are called, they are going to be able to make their decisions in terms of what they're going to get. And they are very information active. In other words, the flow of information that they expect at their fingertips um, and that they want and that they're going after is constant. It is a part of their everyday experiences. So what does that mean for the technologies? Um, on the technology side, it means that we have to think about in the context, all in the context, that we are creating, 
for the developing world as well as the developed world. We also are creating, um, we, are, we are absolutely creating um, mobile technologies and anything can be a mobile technology if it allows a kid to be active and, and moving. We also have to consider the sociability of the technology. That, in other words, um, you know, we tried really hard with that, you know, with our previous uh, form of technologies that, that those screen-based things that lock you to a table and, uh, and, and, and to a chair, um, but that inherently we're social beings. And every time you give, uh, you give a technology to every single person in the room, they're going to clump. Within about five to ten minutes, they're all looking at each other's screens together. It's what it is. All right. Um, and then there is the ubiquity of search. There is that because of our, our information landscape is so wide and large, there is um, an entire large landscape. Now, what I want to do is um, I want to step you over to um, show you a little bit of uh, a story. This story, you say to yourself, well, yeah, that's pretty boring and silly, right? It's uh, Oxen Hill Farm, and it's, uh, we, uh, we're at the farm. Here's a little building where they store stuff, we're, uh, we're, uh, and they don't spell right. We're in a big barn. I'm looking out the door. We're in Oxen Hill. We just hang on to the hay. Okay, this is what it sounds like here. Come on. Okay, um, and all nine kids were here and some additional. Uh, there's a goat in a trough. We milked the cows. Yes, they were taking. This, this is Virginia, the cow. We milked her. We're having lunch. We're going to the bathroom. We're at the bathroom. <laughs> this is such a profound story, isn't it? Uh, we're going to the, pet the cow. These are some horses we saw at Oxen Hill Farm. Visiting the pig, Brody and his sis racing to break the rules. Woo um, cows, uh, rubies, and something else, silos. We're almost done with the day, um, but we're going to explore a little more. Bye. Um, that was actually created on one of these. All right. That was not created on a desktop. That was created, um, it's, uh, it's called StoryKit. Let me go to, wait a second, let me hide this for a second. Uh, and let me go to that. Okay, uh, StoryKit, you can download for free now. It's an iPhone app. I know all of you, run now, right now, get your iPhone app. And um, it's uh, essentially, We've got some, um, you know, public domain books in here, and you can, you know, you can read the Three Pigs, and I'm sure you'll get very excited about that. Uh, this is yes from the Library of Congress. Um, they get really excited about giving us rare books of the Three Pigs, uh, and and so on. But you can also um, edit an existing book, okay? And so you decide you want to put some uh, text in there. Uh, this is my favorite page. Okay, return. All right, and now you can move around the, the text and so on. And um, I can also draw on it. And I know people really just get very excited that we're allowing children to draw on books. Um, ew, that's my favorite pig. Okay. <laughs> um, and so there's the new page. Okay. Um, but what, uh, what our kids were doing when we went to the farm was they had created a new book. And they can, um, you can bring in photos, um, you know, from, uh, existing, from existing places. Uh, you can take pictures and add them in. You can, you can type things as you, as you saw um, and, uh, and add, add sound and so on. Um, what was interesting to us is that when they were using this, it was so about the moment. It was, I mean, these kids were, they were just, they just didn't care what it was going to be later. 
But the interesting thing was we ran into a problem. We wanted to figure out what the next step was for actually creating a, you know, a better version of this application, but we all couldn't look at our pictures together on this. That's a problem, huh? So we ended up, that's when we ended up having this notion of, um, of, uh, of share. And that share sends it to um, a server, uh, one of our servers at the lab, and then turns it into a web page. And so the web page I was showing you of the, of the story um, was, uh, was actually, um, actually can't, is, these are all just from the, um, uh, from the phone. And uh, we have any number of, of very interesting um, stories that actually people from around the world have downloaded onto um, our servers. Uh, this is, um, yes, yeah, an interesting story about uh, fruit. They bounced two times and landed in my lap, so shiny ready for me to peel them open, but then an apple got kind of petty. It was green and wet and full of dew and wanted to be chosen, but before I had a chance to speak, I saw some kiwi dozing. And this goes on forever with all these fruit, okay? <laughs> and we, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Um, anyway, and uh, so we have, and so what's been interesting to us is to actually see, see from a, from, um, you know, social science standpoint, what are the stories that people tell in the moment of, um, of creating things. And so we have one story that actually, this is my favorite one. This is clearly um, by, Lu uh, by Lucy here. Lucy writes a story. <laughs> jelly beans, jelly beans, come in your glass. Bring me some baskets, then you'll look safe. <laughs> Unicorns are bags. Yeah. Lucy gets a school bear. Picture yay, yay, what do you say? Dear, dear Lucy, there's a problem, problem. Pook excesses. And I have no idea what happened. So these are all, these are all stories, and you know, we've got them from all over the world. Um, you know, this, this latest one, I, if anyone reads this language, that's great. Um, so, uh, and they clearly had this imagery, imagery together. Um, but um, so we've just started to try and understand the notion of uh, what I would say is temporal and situational storytelling in with a very, this is very low end. I mean, what you all are doing here with amazing amounts of pixels and interactivity and, and computing power is nothing compared to what we're doing. But it's crazy. For some of these kids, this is space age. Because suddenly, it's not just about a game that their parent is going to let them play with. They can make it. So let me just go back to here. So what does that mean for, for you all? It means that. When you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about designing new mobile technologies, um, you want to think about these various different factors. All right. Um, how many of you have worked with people in other countries? Oh, so I'm talking to like an audience that knows. That's awesome. Okay. And um, and what are the countries? What are the countries you've worked in? Throw out some names. Turkey. Australia, developing country, love it, yeah. <laughs> China, Brazil, okay. Israel, excellent. Well, and certainly, um, and certainly all, of, all of our work gets more and more global as it gets easier and easier for um, us to do this sharing. So it means, though, that we have to consider um, what this means in terms of changes um, uh, with children, okay, we um, and mobile technologies, you not you must know that um, that you need to be hardware agnostic. I know those computer scientists in the room. I am about to say something that's really, you know, heretical and against religion, but you really shouldn't specialize in one technology. Okay, um, you need to specialize in a problem, because guess what? 
if you, if you specialize in those problems, you can bring any technology to bear on those problems. Because guess what? Kids don't care. And the future, when these kids become adults, they definitely don't care about what technology you're solving it with. I'm a computer vision, you know, I, I focus on computer vision, or I focus on AI, or I focus, that means you're basically taking the same toolkit, no matter what the problem is, and bringing it to bear on that problem. So that's like saying, no matter what, I'm taking my hammer, and I'm gonna fix it, even though you may need pliers. And now I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying that's what has been, okay? And it's gotten us really far, because with people that specialize in these tools, we've been able to go some, to some really amazing places. But what I'm saying is to the users, sorry, they don't care, okay? They really don't care, especially if they're children. Um, also, deployment. How many of you think about bringing your technology to the people's hands, okay? In other words, um, in other words, getting it out of the lab and putting it in the app store, or getting it out of the lab and, um, and bringing it to Mongolia, to the rural schools. In fact, um, the computer science professor I work with most often, who happens also to be my husband, um, Ben Peterson, he, um, uh, he and I and a few other folks in, um, have been working on the International Children's Digital Library for many, many years, um, and they wanted, they wanted the International Children's Digital Library in rural schools in Mongolia. And we said to them, you understand, they're not getting internet out there. That's what we, you know, that's the way we deploy. They said, yep, we understand. Come to Mongolia and deploy it. There has never been a harder project that we have ever tried to do in our lives. Um, essentially, uh, the World Bank has been funding us to, to work in Mongolia. And there, it's one thing to say, I work in Mongolia. That's Ulaanbaatar for most people. But to work in rural Mongolia means you essentially have to take uh, uh, two cars, not one, but two, because then you need replacement parts, because what you're doing is driving for three days over no roads to get to, from, one, from one area to the next. And, and then, you're, then you're basically having to put these things on, on the computers that are, um, how they are virus ridden is beyond me because they don't have an internet connection, but they're virus ridden and they want to put on a performance every time you show up in the school because that's only nice. So you're trying to look at the performance, make the computers work, fix their computers for other things. And this is, and this, you can't even write into a journal article because nobody cares about deployment, right? That's the, that's the unheard of thing uh, of what, you know, uh, it just gets there, right? It's half the reason why one laptop per child has not succeeded as wildly as it should have. It's about deployment, folks. And the, in the future, our research is gonna be about deployment. Okay, distance matters. What do I mean? Uh, let's see, how do you do co-design with people that are millions and millions of miles away from you? We've got to come up with those methods that will help you, you know, help us be able to work with users or stakeholders in um, Afghanistan, in um, in the Soviet, re uh, in the Soviet, re bleh, in Russia, in um, uh, in the various places that people need it. Um, in fact, we've been working with UNICEF with uh, uh, with the Iraqi diaspora of children. They're leaving. They're leaving uh, Iraq, and um, they need education. And guess what? They're in six countries surrounding Iraq, and they have no means of education. And so it is with this and SMS they're trying to get education back to these kids. So it's, it's incredible what, we're, what needs to happen and how um, distance really matters. Um, and obviously, uh, I don't have to say to this audience uh, more, uh, more than the technology matters. It's about the need. And as, as I said before, specialize in the need. And you possibly, um, you possibly may find um, you have a wider sandbox to play in. Now, what does that mean for your design methods? Um, for, some, for those of you that um, uh, don't know, um, I actually um, I make new technologies with teams of really great people. but. I also um, think about the design methods you have to use 
Um, if you're working with people that are short and have to go to school and um, have to get parents' permission and, um, and so on. So if we're talking about developing world types of issues and how, you're, and how you may have to deal with the design, you've got to consider, you've got to write into your proposals, write into your, um, into your timing. Um, consider, you have to consider in-person visits. Most people don't believe it, but it matters. In fact, studies have shown that when you're face-to-face -face, um, with people at least once a year, they will respond to you better um, the rest of the time via email and, uh, and so on. Uh, certainly, we can make better use of online tools to, to gather kids' ideas, and we haven't done that enough. And, but we also can empower children to go into their classrooms and become the, and become their, the leaders of design. And so we, in fact, worked with kids in, um, in Germany and Honduras, in New Zealand, and uh, Chicago. That's another country unto itself. Um, over a four-year period to understand um, the, uh, the use of a digital library. And these kids all were empowered to go into their schools and, and to start a project of designing the library of the future. And it was fascinating because they came back to us and said, these methods don't work. They won't design with us. What's going on? And so it was this really ba interesting back and forth of how do you also have surrogates that can be you know, bringing and collecting data. And even if they're short, it's a possibility. You know? uh, OK, wait a second. Um, come back. OK. But let me just try and get there. there we go. All right, let's jump to social um, computing changes, and we'll come back to mobile for a second. Social computing um, has made it so that um, for children um, to be co-located shoulder to shoulder in the same place still matters, but also distributed matters to them as well. We have to design the collaborative experience for children has to be both scenarios. We generally find when people say, I'm doing collaborative technologies, they focus on one, but they don't focus on both. We also find um, that, uh, that intergenerational is very important. That it's not about going up to a kid and saying, yo, kid, how should I design this? They're not going to give it to you. You need to have a back and forth elaboration. The goal of any good design team is the elaboration. So, um, you know, you may have a great idea, and then I say, ah, but if it were green, then imagine what we could do. And then another person says, yeah, but if it were furry and green, what could we do? And we're not sure whose idea it was. But it is a, it's a better idea because all of us brought it together. Um, and intergenerational, I also mean not just, um, you know, adults and kids, but older adults and kids. And we've been actually doing a fair amount of that with, um, with our storytelling experiences using mobile phones to try and understand if these storytelling experiences um, can actually support, better support um, older adults and relationship with, uh, with younger kids. Um, <clears throat> we've also seen, in terms of social networking, there are studies now that kids are more loyal, more sticky um, than adults. In fact, um, kids will go back to Webkins or Club Penguin many, many more times percentage-wise than adults will go to their social networking um, places. And it is, uh, and, and it changes. You know, the Webkins age somewhere between six and seven to somewhere between eight and nine, okay, and then suddenly they're onto another social network. But, and that's the other thing, adults don't change their preferences too much from 35 to 37. But the difference between a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, or an eleven-year-old and a thirteen-year-old, it's enormous, and we don't take that into consideration. Um, we also, in terms of um, in terms of what uh, what we should be thinking about in terms of social networking, it's not just about the virtual; it's about the physical. And so, Webkin's got it right. They um, they what they do is uh, they sell you a password in the form of a stuffed animal. So. Here, kid, here's your stuffed animal. And there's a little tag on it that um, essentially has the password. And um, this notion of combining the physical and the virtual 
is, it, you know, people have not even begun to take advantage of what they should be doing. Now, when you're designing for kids, there's also time limit, time limits you have to design for and bans, okay, at home and school. This is very unique. This is very unique to just designing for kids. You don't have to worry about um, limits when it comes to adults, but for kids, it's very important. Now, what does this mean for your design? Uh, again, consider co-design online. Consider intergenerational, bringing together, um, you know, what are the design methods, and not enough people have thought about it. What are the design methods we use and we create for when there are older adults in the room with kids? Guess what? You can't all get on the floor together when there's older adults in the room. Um, we actually, I made the mistake, I had no idea there was a man in, in the, in our lab that was 81 years old, all the kids got on the floor, and he did too, but I couldn't get him up after we did that. So you've got to, you've got to consider what, uh, what your challenges are. Um, now, observing children in social computing is really hard. So in fact, I was just discussing with um, the students over lunch that we've got some extreme problems with collecting data when it comes to, um, in fact, um, today's, today's technologies. We have a vast, vast amounts of data that we never would have with a typical lab study. We have things always changing. So you've got tools changing under, uh, underneath you. You've got content that's growing exponentially. And then you're supposed to come up with something that's clean and generalizable and scientific. What does that mean? Um, you know, we're, we're talking about extreme research here. Um, and then, um, Basically, again, consider the deployment of, uh, of what you're doing is part of the design process. We made the mistake when we first developed the International Children's Digital Library um, not to consider that an awful lot of people won't put in plugins. We had this amazing interface, but, we, but you know, nobody wanted to download it because it was it, with plugins, so we threw everything away, and in three months' time, it went to JavaScript and, and straight HTML, and as our, um, as our digital library has got grown in uh, popularity online, um, it's been fascinating. Essentially, the, the technology requirements that people have have been going down. So we basically, um, we now have to design for a certain size screen where the rest of you all are, you know, in space age areas. Okay. Um, then you also have to consider the ubiquity of information and the changes that happens. And so with this large amount of information, what, a, what is search? What is search on here today? You have to consider that. And what is a result page? What's a result page on something this size? It's almost impossible to figure out. Um, and it's no longer self-contained information space. So. Uh, the kinds of things you have to consider um, is that you can't deal with, uh, you know, quick little toy data sets and, uh, and the various things we were talking about. The interesting thing is, though, that it is blurring the lines of industry and um, academia. Um, in fact, uh, Google will quickly read one of your papers and start changing things, whether you realize it or not. And so um, there's a lot of people that are looking, um, at, looking at what all of you are doing. And so you've got to consider um, new methods to make sure that you're keeping up with what's happening. Now, in terms of mobile, the changes. Short bursts of use. That's, it may be obvious, but no longer are you getting the kids sitting down for 40 minutes making, writing a story. Are we creating an entire generation of ADHD kids? Possibly. I'm, I'm concerned myself. Um, but essentially, there's, a, there's this constant switching between the digital and the physical. There's a constant interrupt loop here. And because of that, you've got to design for it. You cannot make it so that if they're not concentrating, you lose them. You have to make it so that, um, so that if, they're, if you're competing with the TV, the music, and, um, and something that's going on in the laptop, what can you do on this that you can't normally? I mean, this was fascinating. When we went to the farm with this one group of kids, um, they all were walking around with these. 
And, you know, there you got seven-year-olds all walking around with these, and everyone's looking at, at you saying, what's going on? They're going on a, on a hay ride, and I was sure they were going to lose these things in the middle of the hay, you know? And so you have to start to realize that um, things are going to get lost, things are going to get broken, things are very temporary. And for design, you've got to design in context. You can't have people come to... Uh, come to your lab and, um, and try out X, Y, and Z. It's not going to happen. It's, you, know, you can't test it. You can't design for it. You've got to, you've got to be there in the place. And, um, and basically, you need to consider mobility as a part of your work in everything you do. Now, these may be obvious things to you, sadly enough. They are not obvious to most people that are designing applications for children, uh, let alone applications that are mobile. So what we're seeing in terms of impact uh, is a lot of different things, OK? Um, an increase in, in storytelling and reading. We're seeing this uh, actually from Sesame Workshop as well as from our work. We're also um, seeing a much lower age in terms of technology use. So you've got, you've got two, three -year -old, you know, two and three-year-olds playing with popping bubbles on this thing. And, um, and you've also got SMS kids learning at a very le young age to send three characters that mean something. Um, uh, what they found in uh, Portugal is that children's awareness of, of the everyday has also increased. Why? Because they're focusing, um, because they're using this to focus on, the, on their experience, it turns out that this is a great magnifying glass. And so while, yes, there is this sort of attention challenge, but there is also this wonderful thing of helping you really go focus. So the kids, when we were at the farm, we found out that our group stayed three times as long as most groups ever stay at this farm. And that was because the kids, they just they kept taking pictures, they kept writing, they kept doing things. And it was a, it was a really interesting thing. Um, the National Park Service was trying to figure out how to make that happen across their national parks. Now, um, mobile technology, uh, actually, uh, Matt, Matt Jones has basically said, is a relationship media, that it's to capture and share the moment at the moment. And that's something you want to consider no matter what you're designing. It is, it, is the, it is the momentary experience. It is the social experience that you want to consider. And I want you to keep that in mind when I show you uh, this video. Um, this is my, uh, my PhD student, just graduated. He's now a faculty member um, in New Jersey. Uh, this was his dissertation work.
that goes on forever. But um, uh, that's the work of Jerry Fales, and, um, and basically what he tried to do is say, all right, what happens if, if I get two of these together? What happens if I get four of these together? What happens, how can I, how can I share, the, you know, share the screen real estate, but also how can I, um, you know, let's double pixels and so on, but how can I share the functionality and look at the roles of, um, uh, of collaboration of the creative process? And, um, and so he's, uh, hopefully you'll read the Kai paper on it um, <laughs> in, a, in, a few, uh, in a few months. Anyway, um, so, uh, here, okay. So what I want you to think about is what the mobile future may be. What is it that, um, what is it that needs to happen? Where are, where, are there th where are there really extreme problems that haven't been solved um, that, can, that can benefit from not just these things, but from, you know, essentially uh, micro laptops or netbooks from, uh, there's all different kinds of mobile technologies today. And you want to consider um, bringing anything to bear on these, on these problems because we're only going to get into bigger problems, so why not try and solve the hard ones with, uh, with what we've got. And mobile, um, the attraction of mobile technology um, is that finally, maybe, we get away from the paper and pencil. I'm going to close with a quote from one of my mentors, um, Seymour Papert. Uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he says, for me, the fundamental question is how deeply school is shaped by the properties of pen and paper and writing. My own view is that truly significant change will not come until paper-based technology cedes its prim primacy to electronic-based digital technology. And even then, it will need time for knowledge to reform itself to fit the new medium of expression. And with that, I want to acknowledge my amazing collaborators and team and say thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions, and then afterwards there will be a reception in the uh, foyer outside. Uh, Andrea and Mike will bring the mic to you. Brian, you got right there. Uh, I, I enjoyed your presentation, and you might have, I, I was about five minutes late, I don't know what you qualified in, in your discussion, but I see a lot of overlap with uh, teenagers' use of Twitter, and, or not so much Twitter, but Facebook and so forth. But my question is not what, about that. It's, um, I, I, you, you highlighted some of the problems at the end, and, and I think one of the problems is not in design or use. It's in um, the, 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 as this becomes more ubiquitous, we, we already see problems with people texting while they drive. These are adults who should rationally not worth their attention. It, yes. <laughs> um, I remember running into the back of a car because I was fiddling about on my bike, riding around no-handed, and scraped open my knee when I was a kid. Um, I could see all sorts of issues of separating, uh, not separating uh, the real world from this virtual world in the broad sense of your social community outside of your lo locale. What issues have you seen or, or what do you expect would be some of the things that might be interesting to look at in terms of the, um, you know, the ability of people to disconnect for good and bad? I, I don't know if my question makes sense, but I think it's a broad area where there's some interesting issues. And again, the example of people texting while they drive would be the overarching sort of example. Yeah. Well, I think you, you raise an interesting area of, of research that needs to happen is the impact of these, uh, of these mobile technologies on people's attention, people's you know, logicalness, uh, their, ability to, um, their ability to focus on the here and now. Um, how often are we, uh, you know, are we sending in our last piece of the NSF proposal while we're standing there supposedly teaching something and, and also trying to grade something at the same time? I, I, you know, I, I know I have never been so tired in my whole adult existence as ever as since mobile technology has has crowded my life in fact I, I take trips like this so that I can basically turn off everything and everyone knows they can't get a hold of me and so 
Um, with kids, I think we have to have them understand um, that there is, uh, there are times and places for this, but it's not until we do the social research to understand the impact and, and the behavior sets we're looking at will we really be able to go forward in terms of design. Excuse me. Uh, you mentioned the $100 laptop, and that's now the one laptop per child. Are you aware of any efforts to um, create and develop um, the $100 iPhone, although I believe uh, <laughs> Apple just dropped the prices, and to distribute those in a similar manner? Um, we've been talking to a number of companies about um, the possibilities, and honestly, until the economy crashed, there was a lot of more possibility than there is now. Nokia today is the company that is most widely seen in, um, throughout, throughout the world, and especially in the developing world. And I believe that Nokia has understood the, the possibilities, um, but also the challenges most, uh, most readily. And they do have a much larger research um, presence in California than has ever uh, been the case. And, uh, and there's some really great people looking at what, what the possibilities are. Uh, uh, why do you want to end the primacy of pencil and paper? For me, that's the only medium that's perfect freedom. <laughs> that is what? Perfect freedom. I, perfect freedom. I can draw anything I want, any, any visual image that I want. Uh, I cannot imagine, so I'm, I'm a physics student, and I cannot imagine people learning to, to manipulate advanced mathematical symbols unless they can do it using paper and pencil. Oh, that's so interesting. I, I can introduce you to an awful lot of children that unfortunately cannot connect with physics or cannot connect with the um, abstract concepts on paper, with paper and pencil. And we're losing, we're losing an entire generation of kids um, because they're, uh, they, they are challenged in terms of the, those connections. And it's with interactivity and with visualness that we actually may be able to, uh, to bring more kids back into the science. You are blessed with a, a gift that unfortunately most people don't have. But I would hope someday that most people can do what you can do. I had a question when you were talking about the development aspect of research that you think is gonna be kind of the new emerging field or one of the newer fields. And I was wondering in what regards do you suppose that the infrastructure needs to precede the development of technologies in uh, foreign countries like that? Is uh, the infrastructure, are they infrastructure dependent or independent and I guess uh, what are your thoughts on how those play out? So you're talking about in developing countries, are, is the infrastructure something uh, that it has, a, has an impact on what you can and can't do? Is that correct? Yeah, in what regards is your research, that, have you seen that it, it's both, is it both independent and dependent upon the infrastructure that exists, or is it, is it mainly one or the other? Well, we, um, Every time we go into a developing country, um, we see that there are new challenges that we never expected. And are, you know, are there any developing countries that are, um, that are growing their own stuff yet? No, there's not enough um, infrastructure in place for, for folks in developing countries to really make a dent in what's possible in comparison to what we're doing in the United States. That's a problem. It shouldn't be that way. Um, actually, I do know that one, the One Laptop for Child Foundation actually uh, moved many of their vice presidents into developing countries. And so the, the, the vice president for learning is actually now in Rwanda. So that's the kind of thing that we may have to think about um, to truly um, be a part of the fabric of the culture. So we're going back to anthropology and ethnography in, in ways that we never expected. Yes, um, up here. Um, I, I have a, a kind of follow-up question on the first one uh, where Brian was uh, asking about you know, the, the problem of being distracted by your mobile device. I, I, the, the opposite side that I've had a concern with sometimes is that maybe one would develop a kind of inability to think without the mobile device. I know I've experienced that already myself sometimes in terms of uh, uh, people asking me for something, I say, well, wait a minute, let me sit down at my computer and type out a few notes. I mean, 
It's like I was uh, reluctant to do it without kind of my medium of choice for thinking. And I wonder if any uh, of your research or experience so far has uh, w would lead to tell me that that's a false concern. Um, it's not a false answer. It's basically uh, the tools we think with continually change. And that depending on what kind of thinker you are, you will have different modes of, of, of using different tools. And um, there, are some, there are some children that can only think by tapping. They can only add by tapping points on numbers that they see visually. There are some kids that uh, essentially can do everything in their head, but if they're made to, if they're made to do something visual, they absolutely cannot connect with it. What we're, th what we're seeing, though, is more extreme, um, more extreme modes of interactivity where we didn't see that before. Now, is this going to be a bad thing? I don't know. We, again, more research has to be understood. Um, I think we're moving into a transition where we're seeing many more opportunities to connect to people that didn't normally have that opportunity. And yet, on the other hand, we're, yes, we're creating problems. This is like, you know, what we're doing to our whole environment. We don't know what we're changing with, and we're playing with fire. So we've got to figure it out. I, I note that Plato in, in Republic expressed the concern about the technology of writing, that it would destroy humans' memories. Uh, yeah, at, look, my husband never wanted to give me a GPS because he was sure I was never going to learn how to get around the beltway in Washington, D.C. And you know what? I still can't get around the beltway. And it, he finally gave up, got me a GPS, and I get lost with a GPS. So, I, you know, it depends. <laughs> anyway, I think it may be time, but I want to thank you very much and uh, appreciate your, your time. Thank you.